Greg, uh, good to see you. Anthony Albanese would rather focus on the nice stories when it comes to China and this visit, yet we have seen these clashes today. Do you think that the Prime Minister cares about the human rights abuse issues when he's trying to woo Premier Lee? Well, Danica, great to be with you. I, I give the Albanese government a mixed, mixed report. Um, I thought Penny Wong was quite sensible on Insiders on Sunday, listing some of the things we disagree with China about, and very importantly, saying we're in permanent strategic competition with China in the South Pacific. I think this big panda diplomacy visit is all about trying to reset China in the Australian public mind as a sweet and cuddly thing, whereas it's not a sweet and cuddly thing. It's a vicious, brutal, totalitarian dictatorship. And I think in several key ways, the Prime Minister has underperformed in this visit very very significantly. First of all, on the Chung Lei matter. Now, it's not a huge incident. I greatly admire Chung Lei, but this is not a huge incident. It wasn't a fundamental breach of her human rights. But it was absolutely improper behaviour for foreign diplomats to try to muscle their way around the Australian Parliament House. Now, if Albanese wasn't briefed, he has the most incompetent prime ministerial office in Sydney and the government is fast asleep and should be sacked for incompetence. If he was briefed but wasn't game to simply say, I don't want to overblow this incident, but the Chinese officials were plainly out of order, that's not the way we react, uh, that's not the way we treat journalists in Australia, well, then he's a coward and he has ceded an element of Australian democracy to China. The same with the demonstrators. No other embassy in Canberra can organise busloads of demonstrators to intimidate and influence Australian politics. That's inconsistent with diplomatic practice. Imagine if the Australian embassy in Beijing tried it for a single second. Now, governments of both persuasions, the Liberals were as pathetic as, on this as, as Labor, have not enforced on the Chinese embassy in Canberra the proper restrictions which should apply to an embassy. God alone knows why we allow so many Chinese diplomats to stay in this country, and it is a standing rebuke to the pusillanimity of Australian governments that they won't restrict the Chinese embassy to behaving like an embassy, which doesn't include organising busloads of demonstrators and doesn't include manhandling Australian reporters in our own parliament. Well, I just think it's extraordinary, as you said, that this has happened on Australian soil when we have an open and free Australian press uh, in a democratic nation. Do you think that, in fact, the Prime Minister needs to raise this with the Chinese Premier? So, Danica, I don't want to be unbalanced about this. It's not a huge incident, but Albanese has made it a bigger incident than it needs be because of his apparent extreme timidity about saying... But he's so scared to say anything that might annoy the Chinese and derail this visit. He doesn't need to raise this matter with the Premier. He simply needed to say at the press conference, this is a small incident but completely unacceptable... We utterly stand with uh, Chiang Lei. She's an Australian citizen, an Australian journalist, and this behaviour by the Chinese officials was unacceptable. Then if the Chinese decide to overreact to that, that's up to them. But he is so scared, the Albanese government is so scared that if they say one word out of the Chinese-approved script, they'll get a bad reaction. So the analogous case was after he met with Xi Jinping in San Francisco four or five days after the Chinese Navy had fired sonars at Australian naval divers and caused them physical injury. He still won't tell us, the Prime Minister, whether he raised that with Xi Jinping, which probably means he didn't raise it because there'd be no reason not to tell us. But then he had a press conference but made sure that Canberra didn't release the information about this incident until after the press conference was over. Well, this kind of sort of pathetic timidity. It's unbecoming. I mean, Albo, you know, I've got a lot of admiration. I think he's a good bloke. But this is, this is unbecoming. This looks like a prime minister who's got stage fright, who can't cope with the Chinese just in a normal way. It doesn't have to be, you know, doesn't have to... I, I think Dutton and Morrison did overdo the rhetoric. Doesn't have to go down that road. But if he can't call out egregious Chinese misbehaviour, even on our own soil... Well, that's, uh, that's an overreaction. It's too defensive. It's too timid.
Mm, but I just think that there needs to be uh, more of a stand up for Australian values by this government. I mean, there's been so many uh, incidents as, as I, I went to earlier in my editorial. But look, I just want to ask you about climate because you've written in The Australian today that the oil, gas and coal boom uh, have shattered this decarbonisation myth. Now, we hear it all the time, Greg, that the climate wars that they have been sparked, particularly ahead of the next election. But you don't actually think that is the case. Why? Well, climate is contentious all over the world, except most of the world is not nearly as um, obsessed about it as we are. I mean, it's hardly figuring in the American debate. And in the European elections recently, there was a massive drop in the Greens vote and the European Union has abandoned many elements of its Green New Deal. But simply as a matter of fact, I wouldn't want any of your viewers uh, to take my word for it. And of course, ABC viewers will never hear anything like this. But oil gas and coal, yes, coal, are at record high usage in the history of the human race today. Not only that, global greenhouse gas emissions are rising and are at a record high. So it's simply a matter of fact that the world is not decarbonising. Now, very advanced nations like um, North America, Europe and us are reducing our emissions a bit. But the big growth in emissions comes in China, India, Indonesia, Vietnam, the Philippines, and so on. Now, I don't think, therefore, we abandon the idea that we reduce our emissions, but it's crazy to send the economy bankrupt and massively increase our energy prices in order to reach an insane target like a 42% reduction by 2030. The world will not notice whether we have a 42% reduction or a zero reduction. But if we ended up with a 20% reduction, that would be perfectly fine. It's not going to have the slightest effect on the physical climate. And as a simple matter of fact, the rest of the world is not decarbonising. We are, the world is increasing its greenhouse gas emissions. That may be a terrible thing, but we ought to be aware of that reality when we shape our own policy.